good evening. Welcome to Grace Baptist Church. It's good to see you all here tonight. We're excited for what the Lord is going to do. And so if you'll stand and worship with us, we're going to start by um, singing to the Lord. So go ahead and sing with us. Spirit to come and fill this place tonight, and just for His presence to be all over us and all over this community. So go ahead and continue to sing with us.
fuel camp would have been probably 2010. Oh, wow. Tom was the one preaching the night that I surrendered to ministry. I don't know. I'm sure many of you probably didn't know that. Um, I don't know if you even knew that. Um, I'm excited to hear from you tonight. I'm excited to hear from God. I didn't want this morning to end. I'm glad you guys came back tonight. Um, let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you. Lord, I thank you that you have brought your church back together tonight, Lord, to sit underneath the, the teaching of your word. Lord, I pray for Tom. Lord, I pray for our hearts. Lord, if there's any sin in our hearts right now, Lord, that is hindering or grieving your spirit from moving um, in us, Lord, I, I pray that you convict it. Convict our hearts, Lord. Lord, we want to see you move not only in our hearts, Lord, yeah. but in our in our homes, in our marriages, in our families, in our schools, in our jails. Yes, Lord, we want to move. But Lord, help us to not get in the way. Lord, help us to not grieve your spirit. Lord, I ask tonight, Lord, if there's anything that we need to confess to you, Lord, that we would confess it now, not wait. Lord, please let us be receptive to your spirit. Lord, nothing else matters but hearing from you tonight. We thank you. Thank you for the way that you're working. It's in your son's name I pray. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. You can see here, welcome to Grace. I don't see any first-time guests, but there could be somebody hiding out there. If it is your first time here, delighted to have you. And If you'd be so kind to connect with us, you can do that digitally. If you'll text the word grace to the phone number that you'll find probably on a bulletin if you picked one of those up. Or there's some hard cards out there that you can fill out as well. But we're delighted to have you and we welcome you to, to our church and we welcome you to Spiritual Emphasis Month. We're praying for a spiritual awakening that God will quicken and awaken us. And this week, this Sunday, uh, the focus is living in personal revival. Not my brother, not my sister, not my husband, not my wife but me. Are you living in personal revival? Are you where you need to be with God? And if not, that's okay because we've all been there. But are you willing to pray, Lord, will you lead me there? And when you're willing to pray that and you're willing to follow whatever God leads you to do into obedience, you'll find yourself experiencing personal revival and when there's a lot of us that begin to experience personal revival then we will begin to experience it corporately as a local new testament church so i hope that that's been your your heart's prayer and i can't get away from that blackaby quote that revival you know we said we're not going to have god revival unless god sends it that's correct but also God's given us some criteria. And God says, if my people, which are called by my name, I believe it is God's will for you to experience personal revival. I believe it's God's will for our church to experience revival. Could it be, and this, this is a mystery, that an omnipotent God is waiting on sinful image bearers. Revival awaits the holiness of God's people. Is he waiting on you? If there's ever been a time, our nation needs revival. You don't have to, you don't have, to have a degree in, in uh, sociology to figure out that we're in dire straits. But it always begins at a grassroots level. It begins with God's people. May God bring us to that place. Would you welcome our guest, Brother Tom. There's a little girl <clears throat> in our church. Her name is Olivia. She's probably five years old. She's, uh, she's got a dark tone on her skin. And that youngin, from the time she was big enough to understand things, she looks for me. She waves at me when she can't get to me. When she can get to me, she brings me things like a little rock, a pebble, out of her, uh, 
And I don't know why it's me. I mean, who, why would it be me? Her mom and daddy says she prays for me every night. That young and loves me. She writes me notes. The other day I walked in the daycare. She's at the same one where our grandsons is. And she almost lost her mind. I mean, just it was one of those moments. And I thought when he was talking, that little girl, I love all of them. But she's, Olivia is very special to me. <clears throat> Therefore, if, uh, if she wanted something, I'd probably give it to the whole class of who she is. Wh- what if you're the person? And you're favored by God in a special way. By the way, you have no idea how much he loves you. You are the apple of his eye. You're the object of his affection. Doesn't matter what you've done or where you've been. If you're his child, he adores you. Absolutely adores you. I hope to get to one part of that tonight in just a minute. But I want to thank the students. I got a little box in the mail uh, from you with a pair of these stylish looking boots uh, when I was here the last time. And I wanted to wear them today. And, of course, he made me look back as he had his on. Uh, Kurt did. But, but my feet sweat so bad. I'm just telling you, that's my flimsy excuse. I, I'm going to wear the daylights out of them because they look really cool when it gets uh, winter time. Uh, but, <clears throat> but thank you for that. You know, it's good to be humble just before you step up to preach. It's amazing how God can take somebody really simple. I'm, I'm limited in my education and uh, in lots of other ways. I'm a simple-minded individual to get to be preaching on a night when a young man like that who's made such a difference in your church uh, and... Um, to get to be the one preaching that night, I mean, I just had a tiny part of it. I think about all the people that poured into his life and how God is using him here and the molding and all of the future. But I feel very honored uh, and very thankful to Jesus. I'll take that crown real quick before it turns to pride and cast that right back at Jesus' feet and give him glory for that. I, I'm getting so old now, Pastor, that almost everywhere I go, somebody's either picking me up from the airport or carrying us back. And they, on the way over, they say, you remember when you preached so-and-so? That was the night I got saved. That was the night I got called to preach. And I'm thinking, whoo, boy, all you got to do is just hang around a while. And God will do great things with you, just being faithful to him. And I, I'm very thankful for the opportunity. Turn to Hosea chapter 1 again in your Bibles. I wrote this down. I was going to tell it for the student's benefit. Everybody else, I want you to hear it too, but. Uh, it was camp uh, back in, was it? I guess it would have been 20. We went to camp in 20. It wasn't as many of us, but I had preached it one week at Chautauqua at camp. And a little girl who was on the high school um, volleyball team at Bible Baptist Wilmington got a good dose of it. I mean, the Lord just moved in her life. She got under the burden for her school. She went back, Pastor. She's on the volleyball team. She went back and she started boldly sharing her faith and inviting uh, some of y'all, some of y'all know her, I believe. She started inviting everybody to to come with her to church. One or two started going. She got some influence and they saw Jesus on this young one. They started coming. Before long, Pastor tells me that uh, every member of that volleyball team was coming. Every Sunday, some of them were getting saved. They were baptizing them. Then their parents started coming. There were Sundays where the whole crowd, the coaches, the, the whole volleyball team from Clinton High School, their parents were getting saved. I mean, a little stir of revival, and it all started with one teenage girl. That's why personal revival, that's why the Holy Spirit placed this on your heart. And real revival is falling in love with Jesus all over again. But it has to start in the grassroots way with one man or one woman or one student. And God don't care who it is. Be the most unlikely one in this room. Could be or not. But I just want you to decide I'm going to be that one tonight. And get your card close by and we'll get ready to tear that bottom part off at the end and got something really cool that we're going to do at the close. But I would encourage you to fill out both sides of that part we're going to destroy in a little while with the sins on the blank side. Ask God to speak to your heart. And then on the inside, uh, where, where did God find you today? Be specific. And how have you responded to him? I hope you've done what the card says. You have said, yes, God, you're right. Yes, God, you're worthy. And yes, God, you're Lord. And because you are, I'm going to make some things right in my life. Might not make me the most popular cat in school when I go back. I might not be uh, accepted as much with some of the crowd. But if I've got your smile and I know you're pleased with me, 
I'm willing to do what you want me to do to make things right in, in every way. I'm so thankful for that. Well, in chapter 1, there's a story. I didn't say it this morning, but I told my friends in the back, back there, Denny, that I'm going to say <clears throat> tonight, this is the second greatest story in the whole Bible. The first one, of course, is Jesus, his coming and story of him and his life and our Savior. But there's not a greater story that shows redemption any sweeter or more special than the book of Hosea. And yet, in all these years of ministry, I've never preached other than one little sermon out of that one text about fallow ground. But boy, I saw it. Chapter 1, we see the Lord in verse 1 and 2. The word of the Lord, the word of the Lord. The Lord said, God speaking. You know, one of the elements of revival is hearing God speak. Some of us heard him speak to us this morning, didn't we? Even through whoever, whatever, we heard the, through the word, we heard God say some things. And then uh, he, he had a son. I didn't take a minute to talk about this, but the Bible says that she, this woman of, of harlotry, she bore him a son. You know what I see? At one point, I'm going to show you that tonight, they were in love. This was not just something God told Hosea, hey, go down there and marry a harlot and uh, live with her. Bear oh, no, no. God put love in his heart for her. You know how come he had to? Because the Lord loved Israel and because Jesus is going to love the church. So therefore, Hosea, in order for this, this picture to be what I want it to be, you must love Gomer. And so he did. He loved her. They came together. By the way, just the challenge of thinking about it, where she had been. Who all she had been with. Had to be a hardship for this prophet. And yet he obeyed God and he loved her and he took her to himself and bore a son and said, uh, we're going to call his name Jezreel. And I told you this morning that name means, anybody remember? Scattered, Yes. I'm going to scatter the nation of Israel. And in order for them to understand it, Hosea, I want you to name your firstborn son that you bear with Gomer. I want you to call him Jezreel. There's another form of that word, though. I'm going to show you in a minute. And then, then the Bible says that she conceived again, verse 6. And he, the Lord said, now call her name Lu, uh, Lo Ruhama, which means no mercy. I will have no mercy on the house of Israel. No mercy. There's another form of that we're going to see in a minute. Then after she had weaned Lohurama, she conceived, verse 8, and bare a son, and God said, call his name Lo am I, or Lo am I, which means you are not my people. If there are any question that these last two children were not Hosea's children, we have to just look at the names. I think it's clear that they were born of her exploits, of her time away as she continued to pursue her life of immorality. But then in verse 10, I said in the very early service, if you weren't here, God shows up with his nature. The nature of God, we know I talked about a fallow ground in the first service and forgiveness in the second service. I want to talk tonight, preach a little bit on the faithfulness of God. <clears throat> The faithfulness of God in bringing his people to personal revival. The faithfulness of God. God, in verse 10, changes gears and begins to extend grace like he has extended it to you so many times before, like he'll extend it to you again. Look at what verse 10 says. He just gets through telling them, I'm not going to show you mercy. I'm, you're not my people. I mean, Israel, I'm done with you. I'm going to scatter you. And then look at verse 10. Yet, the number of the children of Israel shall be as the sand of the seas. That's a promise he made to them earlier, which cannot be measured nor numbered. And it shall come to pass that in the place where it was said unto them. Here's what I said a minute ago. God said, you're not my people. There it shall be said unto them, look at this, ye are the sons of the living God. And then he does something really sweet here. I love the way the Lord just shows grace to his children, even when we've messed up. The Bible says, then shall the children of Judah and the children of Israel be gathered together and appoint them one, themselves one head. And they shall come up out of the land. There'll be a day when they're going to come up out of the land. For great shall be the day of Jezreel. Now, wait a minute. That's a different name. Now, I wouldn't have known that because I'm not a real smart student of the original languages of the Bible, but I study after some people who are. You know, this name don't mean scattered. You know what it means? Planted. Planted. 
Oh, yes, I'm going to plant them. And then he says, now say to your brethren, your sister and your brother, uh, and me, uh, instead of you aren't my son. You know what that means? My son. Not low, no, you're not my son, but and me, you are my son. And then Ruhama, not low, Ruhama, not mercy, no mercy, but leave off the no. I'm going to show mercy, and they're going to be mine. Boy, what a beautiful, God leaves little hints like this in the scriptures for us just to remind us that no matter what you've done or where you've been. Hey, when I was a teenager, guys, I'm embarrassed to say that I lived on a roller coaster. Boy, there were times I was near to God. I felt like me and him, I'd get in my bedroom and shut the door and it was a sweet communion. When I was 15, 16 years old. But then the next thing you know, some of my friends would want to get involved in something and I'd go right like a little ignorant putty follow after him and do something really stupid and then you know how I know I saved though is because I felt like a dog after it I felt such conviction y'all know what I'm talking about when you do wrong and you know hey one way you know you're saved is because there'll be chastening and there'll be conviction when you do wrong you know you can't come to church and be in meetings like we've been in these, this whole month. And by the way, it takes us more than a service or two to get right with God I'm glad that you're doing a full month of spiritual emphasis you know how long it took us in 2019? We could use another one now. Eight days of revival. Eight days. I told you I was going to tell you about John Avant. Pastor's probably told you about the revival that broke out in his church many years ago back in the state of uh, Texas. But I'll tell you from two years ago that this is an unusual man with the hand of the Lord on him. Life Action Ministries travel all over the country. Pastor and I actually went to one down in Cincinnati and observed what they did. But then we brought them to Dunn, North Carolina for an eight-day meeting. We were at church, I want you to listen to this, two hours to two hours and a half every night. I'm talking about all those young families with their kids, and nobody complained one bit. They brought 35 young people. They brought two transfer trucks. They set everything up. They had a student gathering. They had a children's gathering. They did all the worship. They had two young preachers that would teach each night, and John would get up to preach. The young people would come in some, we'd do worship, and then they'd go back to their activity. They're getting their mamas and daddies as soon as they get home saying, hey, get ready, we're going back to church. i got to be in my club tonight. i got to be a part of that. You started seeing God move early on. They didn't even give an invitation the first two nights. You remember this, Terry? He preached on honesty. Being humble before God and being willing. And now I know why. I started learning. God's teaching me in the middle of that revival. That you don't just get a person in 2021 to repent before God. It don't just happen. It happens when we humble ourselves before God and we get honest and admit that we're in a mess. And we're not where we should be. And we're not where we could be. And you're not loving your wife the way you should. <laughs> there are issues. But then I'll never forget, that was all day Sunday, no invitation. I wasn't so happy about it, Pat. I'm sitting there thinking, well, bless God, I believe you ought to give an invitation. Now, we told them they could do whatever they want to, but we, no invitation. Music was a little bit different than we were used to, and I'm, in my heart, I'm, I don't know, I don't know. <laughs> Sunday morning, Sunday night, no invitation. But he handed out this little thing. We started... And I've used it, something similar to it, just identifying, asking questions, identifying where your heart is. And I started feeling conviction. Well, I'm wanting them to give an invitation now to get right myself. But that night, I believe it was on Monday night, I'm telling you, they preached a strong message on repentance. Now, I'll tell you what we did that night, real quick. I, I need to get him a text. But that night, he said, I'll tell you what we've done. We've designated the chapel. We had our former meeting area. Seats about three or four hundred. It was out the door, down an outside uh, pathway with a covered shelter over into that other building. They had taken these response cards, similar to what we're using, and put them on the pews. And the goal was that we would go in, turn around, kneel down by where those pews are, and repent. I think they were expecting, you can ask John this when he gets here, they wasn't expecting what happened that night. We'd been praying, we'd been fasting, we'd been asking God to pour his spirit out. So instead of about 20% of the people going, over 80% of the people with broken hearts and tears streamed out of that building when they gave that invitation. And out the door, they went into that room. And I'm telling you, I heard weeping. 
And it felt like travail in that room. There was brokenness. When you got through, you wrote your sin down, not your name, but your sin, and you left it there. And then you left. Would it surprise you to know that the next night when we came in the meeting, there was a difference in the atmosphere? Because as soon as we began to confess sin, and when God's people began to get right with God, then the business begins to pick up. God is now not grieved the way he was, and the Spirit of God began to flow. People started getting right. Folks started getting saved. I told you this morning about getting right with people. I had to do it. There were other people. There's a man on our staff that came in the came one night before the people he he had said this in the staff meeting in front of John and those other guys they said you need to testify that he said is Darren our music worship leader one of the finest boys I know you know him said when I was in college I worked at a jewelry store and I was I was working on a replacing an, a diamond into a setting and I broke a corner off of this woman's diamond but I was such a good jeweler that I could take the prong and I could bend it in such a way that you would never see it. And he said, that thing has worried me and the Spirit of God's brought it to my heart this week and I've been convicted about it and I need to make it right. He called that woman while he was there, not knowing, and he ain't rich, not knowing how much it was going to cost him and what she was going to do if it didn't mean a lawsuit or anything else. But he called her and finally got up with her and the day after the revival was over, she calls him back. She said, you know, I got your phone call and I didn't know there was anybody left that was honest and made things right anymore. She said, not only do I appreciate your call, but you don't owe me anything. And it was all over. I'm going to tell you something. Repentance toward God. Repentance toward each other. And we saw it. It just takes some time to repent. Now let's get in the text. My message is not a long one, so I got to ramble a little bit in that first part. Uh, Hosea chapter 3 in your Bibles. Now I want you to, let me set this up. Hosea has married Gomer. <clears throat> They've had three children. Now you say, how long, what period of time? Well, the Bible doesn't give us a period of time. We know this is a historical event. It's not a parable. It's a reality. This happened. There was a real man by the name of Hosea. There were three children. Here's the way I picture it in my, in my glorified imagination. Hosea comes home one day from his prophetic work only to find the three children sitting there alone unfed, maybe weeping. She's gone. He tries to get things together. He tries to feed them. He tries to be a father and a mother. For how long, we do not know. But instead of her going to her lovers and returning, instead of her committing adultery again and again and returning to the home and trying to be somewhat of a mother, this time now she leaves for good. And how long she's been gone, we don't know. We saw in chapter 2 and verse 8 that there were times when Hosea would go to town fearing that she didn't have what she needed and give her food and give her clothing. She didn't even know it was coming from him. Just the way God pursues us when we're so far away from him and extends grace to us. We don't know how long or how far, but things have gotten really bad. The Bible says in verse 13 of chapter 2 that she decks herself with earrings and jewels. She went after her lovers and Hosea said, she forgot me. The Lord said, she's forgotten. Israel has forgotten me. And no matter how long it was, it was too long. Until we get to chapter 3 and verse 1. Now I want you to see what happens now. Remember she's been gone. Then said the Lord unto me. God comes again and says to Hosea. Go yet. Love a woman. There's that love I was talking about. Beloved of her friend. She was. You loved her. Love her again. Beloved of her friend. You were her friend. Yet she's an adulteress. According to the love of the Lord toward the children of Israel. Remember Hosea. (coughs) The reason for this is I'm letting through you. I'm letting everybody see how Israel has gone a whoring after other gods. Who looked to other gods and loved flagons of wine. So I, Hosea said, so I bought her to me for 15 pieces of silver. And for a homer of barley and a half homer of of barley and I said unto her thou shalt abide for me many days now don't worry I ain't going to jump over that picture I'm just saving it for a little later in the message oh it's a scene when he comes up and they're trying to sell her on an auction block just like a just like a uh, just like something that can be sold as an auction she's standing there 
And I said unto her, verse 3, Hosea said, Thou shalt abide for me many days. Thou shalt not play the harlot. I'm going to forgive you. I'm going to bring you home. And thou shalt not be for another man. No more will you go after other men. So I will also be for thee. I will never be unfaithful to you. For the children of Israel shall abide many days, God says, without a king, without a prince, without a sacrifice, without an image, without an ephod, without teraphim. Afterward shall the children of Israel return and seek the Lord their God, and David their king, and shall fear the Lord and his goodness in the latter end. Now, in a moment, I'm going to give you the end of this story as we have it, and that might be a hint as to what happened. See, the children of Israel are going to return. Maybe Hosea is going to make her way home. Maybe things are going to change. We're going to see it in a moment. God says, Hosea, I want you to go buy her back. This time it's public. I don't just want you to get her and bring her away. No, I want you to go in the public arena. Can you imagine him walking up? As he walks up, they're bidding for her body. They're bidding for her. It's his wife. And he loves her. He's bore a child, at least one with her, and raising the other two. God said, this is my relationship to my people, Israel. This is my relationship to my church. Now, lest we miss the picture, God is Hosea, and we are Gomer. Now, please let that sink in for a moment, brethren, sisters, young people. You see, we see ourselves a lot better than we really are. We kind of gloss over our sin. It's almost as if what we're doing, it might be a mistake, but it's really not a sin. It might not be a good decision, but it really doesn't grieve God. For the first time, I, I think, in my own life, I'm starting to see the depth of the pain and grief that my God feels because of my affections for this world. I'm captivated by it. If I'm not careful, I begin to have things in excess. Food. I need the approval of other people. I, I hadn't planned to mention these sins, but if you want to look at some of them, I underlined a few. Look at chapter 4. He said in verse uh, 1, No truth, nor mercy, nor knowledge of God in the land. Swearing and lying, verse 2. Killing, stealing, committing adultery. All people saying, well, I didn't, I've never done that. Verse 11, a whoredom and wine. Take, by the look of this, they take away the heart. You say, well, Pastor, you don't understand. I, I can have an uh, alcoholic beverage. It doesn't affect me. I, I can do it. Well, the Bible says it takes away your heart. It begins to become way more important to you. And, and up in verse 6, chapter 4, they've forgotten the law of thy God. And uh, they have sin in the lives of the people, verse 8. E e Ephraim, verse 17, is connected to idols. Chapter 5 and verse 5, there's pride. And there's so much more. But beyond all that, the big issue is the heart. The idolatry of our heart. What do you love more? What's more important to me? What's more important to you? What do you spend more time thinking about? What do you spend your resources gathering? Is it personal uh, pleasure? Is pleasure seeking your God? Because it seems to be the God of about everybody I know. We live two hours from the beach and, uh, and there's a lot of folks. And you know when they have to go? Listen to me. I'm not going to run too many trails, but I'm going to run this and it's a hot trail. They want to go on the Lord's Day. Look here, I, I believe in vacations. I take them, I think you ought to. But Sundays, still the Lord's Day. God, and it's, it's, a pit, it's the heart more than anything else. What's important to me? I'm thinking about applying all of this. God is saying to Hosea, and he's saying to us tonight, I am married to my people, my bride. And yet, the nature of our sin and how we minimize it. Jeremiah said we can't even blush anymore. I don't know of anybody that blushes over sin. God sees our sin as unfaithfulness and harlotry. We have gone after the flesh. We've gone after other gods. Hosea, he said, you have been given the opportunity to demonstrate my love to those people who are living in the 21st century, who happen to be living in Clark County, 
who happen to be living in Bourbon County, who happen to be in the state of Kentucky or wherever else I'm going. I want them to know they are important to me. I want to be important to them. God intended for us to be submitted and surrendered to him, and he is to be on the throne. Do you believe that or not? Is he supposed to be on the throne? If not, we've placed something or someone else more important. Let me give you these three little thoughts. Number one, first of all, in this story we see the picture of sin and the Savior. You can't read the book of Hosea, and I would challenge everybody here to read the whole book. It's just 14 chapters, it won't take you long. But you'll see the whole heart of it. There's not much more said about Hosea and Gomer after the third, fourth chapter. But a lot said about Israel, and you'll see the church in it. It's the picture of sin and the Savior. It's the story of God and Israel. It's the story of God and you and me. It's the story of Hosea and Gomer. The picture of sin and Satan. Now we minimize it. But I'm going to go into a little more detail in just a moment and then close. Number two, not only we see the picture of sin and the Savior. Number two, we see the price of our sin. Now, it's not easy to forgive. You know, here's what I saw in this pastor. I never paid attention to it before. God said, Hosea, I want you to go and I want you to buy her back. It's going to cost you money that you probably have little of. In fact, he had 15 pieces of silver. 30 pieces would have been the cost of, an end of, of a person, typically. And then he had to take his harvest, barley. And he had to use that to purchase her too. There's no telling what all this cost him. I don't know. But I want you to see the price of sin. It wasn't easy for Hosea to forgive her. She humiliated him. I don't know if any of you have experienced this. Loving someone and forgiving them after they've been unfaithful to you, but more than likely, they've been unfaithful one time or with one person. This woman has gone a whoring for years. He's humiliated. His children are broken. Children he's raising aren't even his. And God says, not only are you to love her and take her as your wife, but years later, go back and find her and buy her to yourself. And God wants us to see the price of our sin. Did you know, not only does it, is it hard for Hosea, listen to what God is saying through this story. It's hard for me. Oh, it's easy for God to forgive us. Oh, no, it's not. Did you know what God had to do in order to bring forgiveness to me? We have one son, two precious daughters, and a boy that we love. One, just one. They told us we were going to have a third girl. In those days, they didn't do the tests. They just could tell by the rapid heartbeat. And in that, in that birthing room, when he came out, they said, well, hey. And I was standing up there with Terry. Thank the Lord. Up at the top, at the head. They said, it's not a little girl. It's a boy. We both looked at each other. We were bawling like two people do in that moment. And I'm, I can't explain what that boy means to us or the girls. And I love y'all and I love a lot of people. But I can't think of anybody other than maybe Terry that I would give my son for. You know, Hosea was broken hearted. God is broken hearted when I distance myself. Oh, well, I've never committed adultery. Well, good for you. How about idolatry? What else means more to you? When was the last time you got caught up in his presence in worship? When was the last time he felt from you more love and affection than anybody or everybody or anything or everything that you have? You say, Brother Wagner, you're asking a lot. No, God is asking a lot. He wants to be on the throne of your life. And by the way, when he is, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And guess what else happens? <laughs> All these other things you get to have, you get to enjoy, but they come underneath the lordship of Jesus Christ. And when they come underneath that, then they're right. And you can enjoy them and you can be better at everything you do. But it all starts with him being on the throne. Oh God, I want you to be on the throne of my life. Did you know... It wasn't as easy as we think for God to forgive us for our sins, for God to forgive Israel. It wasn't so easy for Hosea to forgive Gomer. In fact, it was hard 
just like Hosea forgiving an unfaithful wife over all those years. Can you just imagine what she looked like? The look of sin and the cost on her and in her. In fact, I want you to imagine with me Hosea going to the slave market. God has spoken. Hosea go by her. And I don't know if he's pulling a cart with barley on it. I don't know if the kids are with him. Little Jezreel and their daughter Lo Rama. Lo and E. They're all maybe they're with him. You kids wait here. He walks up on this scene. You want to know how what it cost for your forgiveness and my forgiveness and why we need to be honest about our sin and write them down and repent and turn from them. He sees the woman that he loves. The one God Almighty said you're to marry. The mother of at least one. Well, all three of these children, but one that he bore. More than likely she's naked. And they're bidding. And nobody's bidding much because her value has gone down. Her beauty has faded. Her value is lower. And there he is. And from the back, who is that, someone says. Who is that man in the back who's raising the the value of the bid so high. We thought we could buy her for nearly nothing. Maybe offer her uh, to others. Make some money from her. Take advantage of her even further. As low as she has gotten. But he says. I'm Hosea. Prophet of the living God. In Israel. And that. Is my wife. The humiliation, the brokenness showing on his face. There's probably tears streaming down his... You know what? Don't... God is saying to us tonight, don't take forgiveness so light. Just because we can come to God and say if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sin and to cleanse us doesn't mean it doesn't cost him something. In the story of Hosea, God is screaming to us, it costs me a lot when you turn away from me as my child. And go after other gods. It cost me everything. Not only do we see the picture of sin and the Savior and the price of our sin, but finally, and I'm done with this, the particulars, the particular sins that break God's heart. I don't want to spend too much time here because I don't want to bum you completely out before we repent, but it's important that I mention them. Look at chapter 8. I'm just going to read them. I'm really not going to comment on them. Lord, help me. It's hard not to. Look at chapter 8 and verse 1. Set the trumpet to thy mouth. He shall come as an eagle against the house of the Lord because they have transgressed my covenant and trespassed against my law. Number one, here's the first sin, the particular sin that broke the heart of God and it breaks his heart today. They disregarded his word. They have disregarded his law, his word. Again in verse 12, I've written to him, the great things of my law, but they were counted as a strange thing. When we do not love and obey and treasure and memorize and soak in the word of God, it breaks the heart of a God who wants to speak to us. If I don't listen to my wife Terry and I'm not interested and my daughter Tiffany texts me today and if I don't regard her enough to even respond to their text, what does it say to them? Well, how much more does it say to God? You've disregarded my word. Number two, you've profaned my worship. Look at verse 11. Because Ephraim, chapter 8, verse 11, hath made many altars to sin, altars shall be made, shall be unto him to sin. Look at verse 13. They sacrifice flesh for the sacrifices of my offerings and eat it, but the Lord accepteth them not. You've disregarded my word. Number two, you've profaned my worship. How's your worship? How's your worship when nobody's around? How's your worship at home? God help us. Number three, you've avoided my work. Look at verse three. 
chapter 8, verse 3, Israel hath cast off the thing that is good. The enemy shall pursue him. You've avoided my work. The thing that I've given you to do, we've avoided his work. Today, the work is the local New Testament church. It's the gospel work all around. He said, you've disregarded my word. You've profaned my worship. You've avoided my work. Finally, chapter 4, look back at chapter 4, verse 5 through 7. You can expect my wrath. Chapter 4, verse 5. Therefore, shall thou fall in the day and the prophet also shall fall with thee in the night, and I will destroy thy mother. My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge, because thou hast rejected knowledge. I will also reject thee, and thou shalt be no priest to me, seeing thou hast forgotten the law of thy God. I will also forget thy children. And as they were increased, so they sinned against me. Therefore will I change their glory into shame. (coughs) The particular sins that break God's heart, those are just a few of them. Can we turn for the final words back to chapter 14, the last chapter? Don't you love the end of the story? I always love a happy ending. I think there's a real good potential of one here because of what he said about Israel returning. I kind of want to pick up again with my story when he, when he bids 15 pieces, shekels of silver. Nobody else wanted to offer no silver. Well, we won't take that. We need more. Okay, here's my barley to make up the difference of the price of a slave. Now she's reduced herself from a harlot to a harlot who is a slave. And he walks up there and they say, who in the world would pay that kind of money? And they said a terrible word when they connect to her name. Who are you? Well, I'm Hosea. She's my wife. I love her. And I came here to forgive her. One of the kind of places in our minds and other things that God has to come to to, to see it. Look at chapter 14. O Israel, return unto the Lord your God, for thou hast fallen by thy iniquity. He said, come back. Come back to me. Got your pencil ready in that card? And look at what he said how to do it. Verse 2. Take with you words. You know what I love about this card, Pastor? I gave you several thoughts You were telling me what the Lord was saying to your team about this. You know your thoughts can be written into words. He said take words. Do you love God enough to write down some words of some things that you know have been grieving your husband, God? Leave them. I'll tell you what we're going to do in a few minutes. We're going to take our words from our hearts, honest sins that we're going to repent of. We're going to tear them off the bottom of this card. And I'd like for everyone tonight after the pastor comes and we dismiss to go out these doors, not any of the side doors, please. Bring your children. Explain to them when you get home all that's going on if they're in other parts of the building. And we'll walk out these doors and out the main front doors and outside there, it's been prepared for us, a large fire. And I want to ask you as a picture of what Jesus did on the cross and how God forgives sins. I want you to walk by with that card and I want you to throw it into the fire. I want you to take a mental picture. Boys and girls, you can do this. Teenagers, you can do this. Honestly repenting so that the remaining part of this spiritual emphasis month can be glorious. He said, take with you words. Turn to the Lord, say unto him, take away all iniquity and receive us gracefully. Graciously, excuse me. So will we render the calves of our lips. And then he said this. I heard Clark Bozier say this. Asher shall not save us. He was a politician. Trump won't save us. Mr. Biden won't save us from where we are now. Politics won't. Look at this. We will not ride upon horses. Power won't save us either. The power in this world. Neither will we say anymore to the work of our hands. Our own work won't save us either. Trying your best won't do it. It takes God and his forgiveness as we repent of our sins. And then he made this promise. I love this, verse 4. Three things. I will heal their backsliding. Number two, I will love them freely. And number three, I will be as the dew unto Israel. I'm going to bring blessing 
and I'm going to bring it so there'll be fruit. If I had time to preach the rest of it, I would, but let me close with this question to you. So how did the story of Hosea and Gomer end? There's a lot of stories in the Bible, true stories, not just parables, that leave you on a hanging on the edge. Y'all know what I'm talking about on that? When I was a little boy, I used to love to go to Child Evangelism Fellowship. Y'all ever heard of CEF, Child Evangelism Fellowship? They used to tell these stories in the CEF, and they'd be missionary stories. And they'd leave, every night they'd leave you right on the edge. Little Ting Ling from over in Taiwan was hanging over the edge of the cliff, just about to fall to his death. And they'd say, now, do you have to come back tomorrow night to find out what happened? I'm telling you right now, I could hardly sleep that whole night worried about Ting Ling. That's the way God ends this story. What happens? I wonder what happens with Hosea and Gomer. Well, he don't tell all of it. I believe he leaves some inkling. You know what Israel did? They, they did return. And then they went right back to it again. And time and again throughout the scriptures, they returned and then back to their sin. I don't know, maybe that happened with Gomer. Maybe she went home with him. Here's the way I'd, I'd write it if I was writing it. I'd write a hallmark ending to it. I would. He'd go up there on that slave block. He'd scoop her up and she'd fall into his arms, broken. And yet in the arms of a person who loved her in spite of her sin, he'd take her home and the youngins and him, they'd bathe her. They'd wash her. They'd take her to a clean bed. And she'd rest for about three days just to recuperate. They'd bring her food. Day by day, she'd start looking a little more healthy, a little happier. She would bask in love she did not deserve as she lived a happy and holy life with her family. That's what I like to write. But I can't tell you exactly how this story ends. Find out when we get to heaven. We know how it ends for Israel. But here's the story. Here's the question I want to ask you. How's your story going in? Did you know you get to decide how your story ends? See, there's a Hosea in heaven named God, Jehovah. He sent a son named Jesus because he loves you so much. He's come for you. He come for you this week. He says, come here. Return to me. I'll take you home. I'll forgive you in grace. I will love you. You get to decide. So let me tell you, how in the world, preacher, am I going to decide this? Well, you've got a card in your hand. If you don't have, there's some in the back as you go out. I forgot to ask when I got up. And I'm going to tell you real quick how easy this is. It's that easy right there. I had to make a decision, but I'm keeping this other part. But this part I wrote on, and by the way, don't you sneak over my corner and try to look at my paper. Not your business, my life, my repentance and I ain't going to sneak and look at yours but I tell you what I will do I will ask you in Jesus name tonight to let your eternal husband God almighty come and bring you back home so that you can enjoy the life he has for you yeah there might be some torn some tearing parts so he can bring you back in there may be some times of pain he didn't promise we wouldn't have those but they'll all be to draw you nearer to him so that one day when you get a look at him, I'm trying to imagine what, what Gomer thought. Who's bidding for me? And I've heard that voice before. That sounds like Hosea, but it couldn't be him. It's been years. He don't want me anymore. Oh, you, ain't, you, you, missed up, you messed up on that one, Gomer. He not only wants you, he loves you. He's come back after you. He ain't going to let anything stand between you and him. Father, I've tried to preach exactly what you laid on my heart for this, these three days. I know it's what you wanted. I know I could have done better, Lord. And, but I, I want you to do it through me. And I, and I know if I've left something out, Lord, forgive me for it. But I, I really want to be thorough but tonight, I'm asking you, Holy Spirit, to speak to every family and every single in this room, every teenager and young person, every mom and dad. And may tonight, there not be some that skirts out other ways or throw in blank cards.
But may we honestly and humbly write down what you have placed on us. And may we write down, Lord, where you found us this morning and where we are now and the commitment we're making to draw near to you during the Spiritual Emphasis Month. Lord, may we be a people that are living in love with Jesus and living in personal revival and living sent in these last days. And we'll give you all the glory for it in Jesus' name. Here's the invitation. Take a moment right now while they're playing. Would you stand with me? Take a moment. Would you do it? There's room in the altar. Join us. Take a minute right now and get your pen out and write down. Whatever God's leading you to do, I invite you to do it right now. You say, preacher, how important is it for me to humble myself? Well, it happened before every great revival. If God's spoken to you <coughs> this week, maybe it's been a while since you since you've walked down an aisle, might do you good. Would you do it? Humble yourself before God and your brothers and sisters. Find a place broken before Him. Lord, I find myself in my sin. I'm not as near to you as I have been. And Lord, you've spoken to me. Hey, don't be a Pharisee, please. Don't be full of pride. Humble yourself, therefore, in the mighty hand of God. He'll exalt you in due time. In a moment, we'll be finished. When we are for this, this second part of a four-part series, we'll walk out together. And don't be in a rush. After your friends and brothers and sisters drop something in, we may sing one verse while we're out there. We might do it. Of what can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. We might sing one verse. Holy Spirit, these are your people. Would you help them to know the love of the Spirit? Romans 15. Jesus, this is your bride. Would you help them to know how much their heavenly bridegroom loves them? Father, these are your people. I'm your son. I'm so glad that you continue to pursue me. You are loved with a love that will not let me go. So speak, Lord, in the quietness of this moment. And we'll give you glory for it. Jesus name. sing another verse is the word of God preeminent in your life I'm amazed at the number of those that name the name of Christ that their lives fall more in line with the world than they do the word and we're getting to the place in our country where if you're going to make the word of God preeminent that means top, on the top shelf, the most important thing in your life. 
going to cost you something. Is the word of God preeminent? Maybe here lately, you've sort of disregarded God's word for your life. I don't really have to try to guess what it is. The Holy Spirit's a really, really good teacher and can point those things out. Is there an area where you've just been disregarding God's word? How's your worship? It's so easy to come in and get caught up and go through the motions. Is your worship genuine? Is your worship authentic? When you come to the house of God and the word of God is preached and we worship, it always bothers me. I can't sing a lick, but it always bothers me when I look across the room. I see somebody standing there with their hands in a pocket and their lips not moving when we're singing to the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. The Bible says make a joyful noise to the Lord. How's your worship? God sees our worship. God sees our relationship to His Word. Are we living with an eternal perspective? Here's what I know. There's a date on the calendar with your name on it. I went to Peyton's father's funeral yesterday. Incredible funeral. but One of the best funerals I've ever attended. They honored their father, but it was Christ honoring. Right back there about three months ago, Ken and I stopped and chatted and the Lord had allowed our paths to cross. We didn't know what the future held and talked about some of the possibilities. He's in heaven today. One day, you and I are going to be ushered into his presence. And the things of this earth that we've given our lives for won't matter three milliseconds once we're ushered into heaven. Live for Jesus. May the word of God be be preeminent in your life. May you worship the King of Kings. May you experience personal revival today and tonight. I'm going to sing another verse. If you need to do business with the Lord, run to the throne room of heaven where you'll find grace, where you'll find mercy, where you'll find forgiveness, where you'll find all the help that you ever need. But you have not because you ask not. So tonight, whether there at an altar, if you need to do business with the Lord, may personal revival begin in your life tonight. And it always begins with repentance. So as we sing, if God has spoken, this verse is for you.
glory of your name. Let revival come, let the people sing the glory of your name, the glory of your name. Amen. I hope that is your heart's desire for revival to come. And I pray that you leave living in personal revival. Amen. Make sure you get by to see Brother Tom before you leave. Don't forget, let's take our cards and let's, as we exit tonight, let's uh, uh, have a little visual of what God does with our sin. Somebody said God can do anything. He is omnipotent, but he cannot do anything. The Bible tells us, number one, he can't sin. He can't lie because he's perfect. Say God doesn't forget anything. Oh, yes, he does. He forgets your sin. When you've genuinely come to the place where you've asked him to forgive you, he forgets it. So may we have a visual that we've been, that we've been forgiven and that we can let that personal revival begin to swell up in our hearts and lives. Amen? Amen. It's been a good day in the house of the Lord. Make sure you greet those around you, but make sure you make your way by the fire pit. Let's throw those cards in there. Amen. You're dismissed.